1 John uh, chapter 5. That's where we left off, and that's where we're uh, probably going to end tonight. We're probably going to finish this little letter, 1 John. I was reading, as I was reading through this last chapter, uh, there's a word that John repeats throughout his letter. It's only uh, just a few pages. It's not very long. But he uses the word no, K-N-O-W, not N-O. Probably about 26 or 27 times in this little letter, we see the word no. And there, there are actually two Greek words that are translated no. And, and one is gnosis, and the other one is idol. And they're really kind of interchangeable. They're very, very close in meaning. So uh, we can't really draw a distinction between the two. And I think all of us, we know what no means. We know. If you know something, it's knowledge. You're convinced of it. You're assured of it. You know it. And I'll tell you what, if there's ever been a time when we need to know what this word says, it's now. We, didn't, we need to know what God's word says to us as believers. We need to be sure, you know, when, when you get the doctor's appointments lined up, you need to know what God's word says. Or when you start getting the letters in the mail about, you know, what you owe or what, you know, you need to know what God's word says. Or when all kinds of things aren't working the way they ought to work. And it seems like everything in the world is just falling apart. How many people have ever been there? You need to know what God's word says. You need to know it. It's not how you feel. See, a lot of times we, we make the mistake of going on feeling. If we feel good about something, then we say that's good. You know. But it's not about how you feel about it. It's you've got to know what God's word says. You've got to know. And uh, John, when he wrote this letter, if you remember when we started out, I said that he wrote his letter very specifically to combat certain false teachings that were creeping into the church. Uh, and and the, the teachings were, were actually called Gnostic teachings, and that word knowledge. They, there were people saying that just knowing Christ wasn't enough. You had to have certain kinds of esoteric, hidden, and secret knowledge. And it's really no different than today. You know, you got the... Uh, the Da Vinci codes and stuff, and you got the all the secret. Uh, you got the secret um, uh, organizations where you got to go in and learn secret handshakes, and it's you know. And they'll say a Christian, you can be a Christian, but but it's a secret, and, and it's certain knowledge given only to certain people. It's really no different then than it is now. We have lots of them. It's maybe some of them look a little more respectable than they did back then, but it's all gnostic. It's all it's all human centered. Uh, humanism. It's, it's based on what man can do to make himself acceptable to God. And of course the Bible teaches there's nothing that man can do to make himself acceptable to God. There's, there's zero. Uh, but John wanted us to know some things. And we're just going to read through this last chapter and pick up a few passages here. And then uh, he begins by saying, well, let's just, let's just back up to verse 21 in chapter 5. <clears throat> well, we ought to back up to verse 20. <laughs> Is that okay? If a man say, I love God, and hates his brother. Now, it doesn't say, you know, hating is different. And I've said this, you've heard me preach before. You know, you can't like everybody, but you shouldn't hate anyone. Okay? Not liking someone doesn't mean hating them. One time I made the statement, you have to love everybody. If you can love them, you don't have to like them. <laughs> and but I, got, I, got, you know, I got really lambasted over that. Well, how can you like them? And not liking isn't hating. Okay? He says, if, if, uh, if, if, um, if I say I love God and hate his brother, he is a what? You can't do love, the love of God and hatred of man just don't go together. See, it just doesn't, it just can't coexist. We got to know that. There are some people who will justify 
and even whole denominations or churches will justify hatred of a certain race or a certain denomination or a certain group over here or a certain group over there and they'll justify it and they'll say well you know God's word says and they say it says right here if you hate somebody you can't have the love of God in you the man say I love God and hate his, hates his brother he's a liar for he that loves not his brother whom he has seen how can he love God whom he has not seen and this commandment have we from him that he who loves God love his brother also Okay, now, verse, chapter 5 and verse 1. Whosoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. If you believe that Jesus is the Messiah, that Jesus is your Savior, you are born again. You're born again. The Bible says you must be born again. Okay? Whosoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone that loves him that begat love him also, loves him also that is begotten of him. So we love Jesus, who is God's only begotten Son. We should love one another, because if you're born again, you are the begotten of the Father. Not the only begotten, because, you know, not the only begotten Son, because that's Jesus. But we've been adopted, and we've been born again through the Spirit. Now listen to what he says, the first we know, okay, verse 2. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments, okay? If you love God and keep and live according to his word, you will love your brother. If we, you know, Jesus said this, seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. And you might say, well, you know, there's some people in this world that I just, I just, you know, I have this hatred. You need to start loving God and keeping his commandments in a higher level. Because remember, as we were going through this letter, as we went through the earlier chapters, we talked about the process that God brings us through. You know, I wasn't completely, I'm still not completely the way God wants me to be. When I first got saved, there was a lot about me that was not pleasing to God. I was saved by faith in the blood of Jesus Christ, but he began a work in me and he began to change me and do things in my life. I, I, began, I, I began to learn that God wants to conform me to the image of his son, and he wants me to practice righteousness. He wants me to practice and live his commandments. We know, he says in verse 2, that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. So we love God, keep his commandments. That love to our brothers and sisters will begin to manifest itself. It's a fruit of the Spirit. Okay? He says, for this is the love of God, in verse 3, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. What God expects of us, Jesus said it like this, Come unto me, all you that are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, because my, burden, my yoke is not burdensome. It, uh, my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Jesus said that in Matthew chapter 11. So while the world tries to portray faith in Christ as being like a, a, you know, a burdensome thing, it's actually a liberating thing. It sets us free from sin. Religion is a burden. When you start practicing religion, then that's a burden because then you have all kinds of stuff you've got to do to make some, somebody happy to, with a big hat on, okay? You've got to make them happy. But, but a, a relationship with Christ is a freeing thing. It's a freeing thing. He says in verse 4, For whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcomes the world? But he that believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Now, we're talking about things that challenge us. You know, medical appointments. I hate medical appointments. Tests. Tests. I hate tests. I hate the word 
biopsy. That's the ugliest word in the English language. It really is. Hate that. Many of you have endured. And thank God for doctors and medicine, but let's face it, sometimes it can be trying. I, the, the, the world we're living in is such a challenge for believers. And uh, for those of you who were here Sunday evening when Dick Samuels was here and were sharing about, their, Dick and Patty were sharing about their experiences on the mission field overseas, we don't, we don't really know what persecution is like. Nobody's ever tried to cut my ear off with a machete. Nobody's ever shot at me because of my faith. Or you, I don't think. Yet. <laughs> yet. That hasn't happened yet. You know, there's other kinds of persecution that we receive, that, you know, verbal and uh, from, we talked about the intelligentsia and so forth. But there are folks in the world who are getting shot at, thrown in prison. We got to know that we can overcome. If that were to start happening here, we will overcome it. We saw pictures of people who, were over, who had overcome intense persecution and oppression because of their faith. And there are people all over the world like that. And there are people in this room who have overcome things, maybe not that intense, but have overcome by their faith. We're still standing. We're still worshiping God. We're still believing what God's Word says. We haven't turned our backs on Him. We haven't gone back into the world. We haven't gone back into Egypt. We haven't paced back and forth and said, man, things were a whole lot better before I was saved. Maybe you thought that once or twice, but then when you come to your senses, who is he that overcomes the world but he that believes that Jesus is the Son of God? This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that bears witness because the Spirit is truth. Now, if you get yourself some commentaries and read about this verse, you'll probably get about as many opinions as books you can find about this. Okay. When they talk about the water and the blood. Some people say the water means baptism. But Jesus didn't have to be baptized. He was. He did so to fulfill all righteousness' sake. But that, he wasn't a sinner. He didn't have anything to repent of. You know, John baptized him. And the Christian baptism is different than that anyhow. It's not baptism. But what does water and blood mean? Well, we understand the blood of the cross. He shed his blood for the forgiveness of our sins. But where's the water come in? It can mean two things. I'll tell you what I think it means. He was born a man. Over in John chapter 3, remember, uh, Jesus told Nicodemus, you have to be born of water and of the Spirit. I believe that reference is to water is to natural birth. That's my opinion, and somebody will have a different opinion, and that's okay. You can have whatever opinion you want. Regardless, Jesus was born a man. He was, he was completely man. And he shed his blood. He was completely the, 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 the spotless sacrifice of the Lamb of God. And it's the Spirit that bears witness because the Spirit is truth. It's the Holy Spirit that empowers us to witness to who Jesus is. So we have the water and the blood and the Spirit. He says, for there are three that bear record in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. Some people believe that this verse does not belong in the Bible. It's in my Bible, so I'm going to read it. If you, if, you know, it's, it's not in some of the, uh, a lot of the older manuscripts. That's all right. It's in mine. <laughs> okay. Verse 8. And there are three that bear witness in earth. The Spirit and the water and the blood. Jesus Christ, fully man, completely 100% man, completely the Son of God who was willing to shed His blood for the forgiveness of our sins, Isaiah, the, the, the suffering servant of Isaiah chapter 53, and the Holy Spirit that was given to empower the church to become witnesses. We're called to be witnesses of who Jesus was. The same Jesus 
And the same spirit that empowered John, the same spirit that empowered Peter and Paul and all the early apostles, is the same spirit who's here to empower you and me. We know this. It's in God's Word. It's the same Holy Spirit. It's not different now than it was 2,000 years ago. We don't need a new reformation. We don't need to rethink the Bible or rethink church. It's been the same. Christ hasn't changed. His spirit hasn't changed. The sacrifice he made on, on the cross is still as effective today to, to save and to deliver as it was back then. That's the witness. He says in verse 9, If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God which he has testified of his Son. You know, I don't care what man has to say. I want to hear what God has to say. Because it just seems, and I thank God for great preachers and great teachers, and, 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 and men and women who have expounded on God's Word uh, under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, that we can read and learn things. But you know what? It doesn't matter what man's opinion is. It matters what God's Word says. Listen to what he says. We're still talking about the first no. We've got a few others to go here. He that believes on the Son of God has the, the witness in himself. He that believes not God has made him a liar, because he believes not the record that God gave of his Son. So if you're born again, if you're saved, you have within you everything you need to be a witness for Christ. We need to learn. We, we come to church and we learn things and we fellowship with other believers and we get encouraged and we get blessed and we get taught and we learn and we, and we learn by example. And that's, that's the way it's been all the way through the, the, the church age. But ultimately, you have every piece of equipment you need to be a witness for him. Because we know. We know. Verse 11. This is the record that God has given to us eternal life and this life is in his son. If you remember, go all the way back to the very first chapter of John's gospel. And what did he say? In him was light, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. Jesus is life. And he gives us life, and he wants to give us life more abundantly, not stuff abundantly necessarily, but the, the life that we have in him, he wants to make us more like him every day. An abundance of life. Verse 12, he that has the Son has life, and he that has not the Son of God has not life. That's kind of pretty clear cut. You're either saved or you're not saved. You either know Christ if you have the Son, Jesus, you're saved. If you don't have the Son, you're not saved. That's, there's some folks that try to blur that, blur that around and say, well, yeah, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. Verse 13. Now, we come to the second no. Okay, know this. We know that we love the children when, when we love God and keep His commandments, okay? Verse 13. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God. This is for believers. If you're not a believer, this doesn't apply to you. That you may know. Okay, here's what we know. Here's what we know. That we have what? Eternal life. And that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. We need to know that we have eternal life. And eternal life isn't later. Eternal life started the day you started believing in Jesus. Eternal life started the day you call upon the name of Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Even though we're not in heaven yet, that's, that's going to be our eternal home. But our eternal life began here. Even though this body has not been resurrected yet, it has not been redeemed yet, this body still has a tendency to drag me down. Not just physically, <laughs> but man, my flesh... I, my, my flesh is just, as, is just as wild as it has always been. And if I let myself, if I turn my back on God, and I start following my flesh, you'd be reading about me in the newspaper. Some preacher, there goes a preacher, another preacher, down, down the tube. We, this, we think that we get saved, and all of a sudden, this, this, this is still, I still got to keep my, the Apostle Paul says, I got to keep my body under. Anybody know what I'm talking about? 
It's hard to do when they make such good beef stew on <laughs> lunch. Okay. That peach pie looked awfully good. All right. But, <laughs> but you have eternal life regardless of what's going on. See, see we'll, we'll, again, Paul is trying to combat teaching that says, uh, you know, to get eternal life, you have, to, you have to ascend a level. You have to climb the ladder. You know, you have to get up to the top, to the top um, you know, the top rung, uh, the top degree there. You know, you got to get up there. But the day I got saved, before I understood, before I even owned a Bible, before I had any kind of knowledge, or before I learned anything, before I could preach or play music on the guitar for the Lord or any of that, before the, the day that Jesus Christ became my Lord and Savior, from that moment on, my life was eternal. I was adopted into the family of God. I received the spirit of adoption, whereby I could cry, Abba, Father. Before I even knew where that verse was, I could do it. Because we know that we have eternal life and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. Look at verse 14. And this is the confidence that we have in him. That word confidence, it's really the same word as like boldness. Like you come boldly to the throne of grace. If we ask anything according to his will, he will hear us. Well, let's see. See, oh God. You know, uh, give me, a, you know, let me hit the, you know, the publisher clearinghouse. <laughs> let me get the check, you know, and the balloons and the champagne. Right? Well, see, people take stuff like this so out of context. And, and if we know that he hears us in verse 15, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desire of him. Do you know that God hears and answers your prayers? If we ask what is in his will, according to his will, there's the key. 98% of the stuff I ask for is according to my will. And the other 2% of the times I just happen to hit it, that it might be his will too. How do we know what his will? How do we know his will? Some people think just because it feels good, it's his will. Some people think because it's, it makes us kind of feel good inside. I've told this story a, a million times. I've, I, was, uh, I, was, I was talking to a lady one time, this was years ago, and, and she was, and I thought, and she was saved. She was a believer. She was a nice lady, good lady, loved the Lord. And she was talking to me. She had seen a movie, okay? It was a secular movie. Uh, just, you know, if I named it, maybe some of you have seen it. I'm not putting down movies. But she has seen this movie, right? And it was just, it wasn't, it wasn't a, a religious, it wasn't a, a Christian movie. It was about something. And she said, oh, that movie was really anointing. And I said, I thought, well, I didn't say anything because I wasn't, I didn't have the boldness back then. But, but I thought to myself, I said, it wasn't anointed. If it was anointed, it would have been talking about Jesus Christ. Just because it was a, you know, kind of like a made, it made you feel good or kind of feel real warm and fuzzy inside, that's okay. It's a good, you know, movie. You get, get your emotions up. Okay. But it wasn't anointed from God. If it was anointed from God, it would be lifting up the name of Jesus. You see, how do we know his will? Well, one way is according to his word. If it's not in his word, it's not his will. I've heard people claim, oh, God told me. And they get, go do some crazy, n nutty thing. And I say, God didn't tell you to do that. Well, how can you tell, can you tell me God? Did? Because it's not in his word. As a matter of fact, his word says the exact opposite. <laughs> you know, people do things that go against what God's word says. And they say, oh, God, I was anointed God. I just the spirit of God. No, it wasn't. It might have felt good when he was doing it. How do we know his will? Well, according to his word. And not only according to his word, but God will show us if we're, if we're listening and if we really care about what he wants. I have found that he'll show us how many people can testify. God will speak to you. He'll show you what his will is with no uncertain terms. There were a few times that God showed me his will that I wasn't too crazy about it. 
But I have found that the more we read his word and get in his word, the more that we will understand what his will is. And just like when the time comes, when Jesus was in that garden before the crucifixion, he said, not my will, but thine be done, Father. And he realized where he was going. He realized what was about to happen. There's sometimes when God's will is not necessarily, does not necessarily line up with our plans. As a matter of fact, sometimes God can interrupt our plans. How many people know what I'm talking about? Brother Lou has a good testimony. <laughs> sometimes God can interrupt our plans and put us somewhere where we think, what in the world am I doing here? But you'll find out if you really his, if you, if you really care about him. You'll find out. He'll show you what his will is. Okay? We know that whatever we ask according to his will, our petitions will have the petitions that we desire of him. God will answer our God-centered prayers. We've got to know that. He might not do it tomorrow. It might be a week, a month, a year, or many years. But God hears and answers prayer. We've got to know. We've got to be convinced. We've got to have the confidence and the boldness that when we go to the throne room of grace and we make a petition to him, somewhere down the line, God is going to answer that prayer. We've got to know it. We've got to know it. We've got to be convinced of it. Everything around us, our circumstances will tell us God's not even listening to you. But if you're a child of God, listen, if you ever had a child, did you ever just shut them off? When your child cries to you for something, like a mother, when she hears her baby cry, what, she goes. When our father hears our cry, he comes. We've got to know. We've got to know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. Look at verse 16. Oh, we come to another touchy one here. I was going to pass over this chapter. I was going to think of other stuff to say, and see, maybe I'll just forget about chapter 5, but look what he said. If any man see his brother sin a sin, which is not unto death, he shall ask, and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. Talking about making petitions to God. There is a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall pray for it. Whoa. The sin unto death. The sin unto death. Well, some folks will say, well, that must be the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, because Jesus said that's the only sin that can't be forgiven. But I don't think it means that. I don't think it means that. You know, when a believer sins, or even when an unbeliever lives in sin, but when a believer sins, the Holy Spirit convicts us, doesn't he? How many people say, no, what I'm talking about? The Holy Spirit convicts us, tries to draw us back. I believe that when he's talking here about this, you know, if we see a brother or a sister beginning to go astray or go off the path a little bit, it behooves us to go to them in love and pray for them that they might see the error of their ways. I believe that there's a place, and we talked about this before, there's a place where folks can get and cross over a line where they're, they're given over. And let me give you a couple examples so you understand what I'm saying. King David committed adultery and murder to cover it up. God sent the prophet to him. David repented and was forgiven. Consequences, tremendous consequences to his actions, but he was forgiven. The king that preceded David's name was what? Saul. Remember Saul? King Saul started out good. He sinned. Samuel went to him and confronted him with his sin. And he kind of sinned again. And got to the point where God told Samuel, don't pray for him anymore. That's a scary place to be. Okay. If you see a brother or sister begin to deviate, pray for him. Pray for him. It's God's will that people be restored. It's God's will that people come back to Christ. That's his, it says it in his word. 
You who are spiritual, when the, when the brother fall, you who are spiritual, such a one, restore them in the spirit of meekness. It's God's will. When we see somebody gone astray, pray for them. Before you do anything, pray for them. Don't get on the phone and talk about them. <laughs> That's what we like to do. Hey, hey I want to pray for so-and-so. Yeah, you know what they're doing? <laughs> okay. Pray for them. Pray for them. And I believe this word says we got to know that God will hear and he'll do whatever it takes. There was another instance you know, when Paul wrote the letter to Corinthians, the first letter to the church of Corinth. There was a brother in there who had taken his stepmother as his girlfriend. Paul said that's something even the pagans didn't do. <laughs> Paul said, you know what? You need to tell him out the door. You need, to, you need to turn him over. He said, turn him over to Satan. Not viciously, not to see him punished, but to see if he's really saved. And what happened, if you read 2 Corinthians, you find out that the guy repented and came back. They won their brother. They won their, they won their brother. They prayed for him. The sin wasn't unto death. Why? Because he repented and he came back. Okay. If any man see his brother's sin which is not unto death, he shall ask and shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. We need to pray. There's sometimes God might say, quit praying. We need to listen to the Lord, all right? Now, verse 17, look. All unrighteousness is what? Is sin. And there is a sin not unto death. And in other words, you know, Christians can fall into unrighteousness and they can be restored. In fact, it should be our heart's desire to see a brother or sister fallen restored to a right relationship with Jesus Christ. Okay, another no in verse 18. We've got a few more here. We're going to close. We know that whosoever is born of God sins not. Man, John is, John is so tough. We know that whosoever is born of God sins not, but he that is begotten of God keeps himself, and that wicked one touches him not. Remember, when we, when we talked earlier in this letter, John used language like this. We do not, listen, a believer does not consciously, willingly allow, him, uh, allow himself to live in sin, at least not for any amount of time without being convicted. If you're a believer and you're truly born again and you do allow yourself to fall in sin, the Holy Spirit will convict you. What John is saying here is, listen, the presence of the Holy Spirit, the witness of the Spirit in our lives will keep us, will keep our minds set to a place where we'll desire to live lives glorifying to God. We fail sometimes, we make mistakes sometimes, but there's a process where God restores us. Don't kid yourself. Paul said, again, he goes back to Galatians, the Apostle Paul wrote, Be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man sows, that shall he reap. If you're born of God, you don't practice sin. You don't live a sinful life. He says, We keep ourselves, and the wicked one, Touches him not. You know, the devil can't do anything to us that we don't let him. I'm convinced of that. I'm convinced that, we, you know, sometimes we give so much glory to the, to, to the devil. And he's a powerful being. But a child of God, you know, he can oppress us. He can attack us. He can, he can uh, you know, send his minions against us and have all kinds of things happen to us. But he can't, he can't make us sin. The devil can't make you do anything. I don't care what Philip Wilson said. <laughs> Verse 19. And we know that we are of God and the whole world lies in wickedness. We know there's a difference between us and the world. You've got to know there's a difference between us and the stuff that's going on out there. My God, what's going on in the world? What do we read about, hear about? I... 
Can some of you who are old enough to remember, you never ever heard a curse word on TV. Remember that? I'm even old enough to remember when they didn't even do it in the movies. Now you hear it on commercials. The wickedness. Do you feel, you know, I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Do you ever feel like, what am I doing here? I don't belong here anymore. With what's going on in the world? And I'm not saying that looking down my nose at anybody. That's just the way it is. The world is going to hell in a handbasket. It's worse. And it was bad in his day. John was writing this 2,000 years ago. It was bad in his day. It hasn't gotten any better. It's gotten more technologically savvy. Verse 20. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us an understanding that we may know him that is true, and we are in him that is true, even in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. We know that Jesus has come, and thank you, Lord, and he's given us understanding. You have understanding and unction, he said earlier in this letter from God, that we can understand. It says in Proverbs that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. He's given us those things. We know that. We know that. You got to know that. You got to be anchored in these truths. As believers, we can't allow our faith to be shaken by whatever the world says or by whatever science says or by whatever religion says or by whatever the president says. We can't be shaken. We've got to be rooted and grounded. And he finally says this, and he closes his letter, and we're closing our study in 1 John. Little children, keep yourselves from <laughs> idols. Oh, we don't have that stuff nowadays. You know, I, 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 I went down, we, uh, a couple weeks ago, Rose and I went to a retreat down at uh, Nemecolon Woodlands, which is a very fancy place, really a ritzy place, nice place. Really nice place. And we walk through the, the halls of there, and they have artwork, you know, beautiful artwork, and just very exquisite, just a beautiful place. And in one of the halls, he had a couple, they had a couple totem poles. You know what a totem pole is? Yeah. Okay, totem pole. I looked at that, and, I, I, and, and they had other things in I looked at, and they were all, you know, probably worth like a lot of money, you know, and really like nice looking things. But they were all spiritual things. Have you ever, have you ever looked through your house to see if you have any idols? Now, we don't think in terms of idols because, you know, in John's day, they would have literally idols. And, and I grew up in a church where they, had, they prayed to statues. I'm not going to go that route. But, you know, we, don't, we, we might not have those kinds of things. But our idols, I think, are much more subtle. Our idols are much more subtle. We might not have a Buddha or a totem pole. Or a, but what do, you, what do you put before God? What... What do you allow to draw your focus away from God? I'm sure, we could all think of something. Money. Money's a big one. People. Boyfriend, girlfriend. You know. Work. Sports. What is so important? What is more important to you than what this word says? Little children. Keep yourself from idols because that will identify the idols in your life. What is more important than this? I think we all have our pet idols. We all have our pet things that we like to, you know. But John closes his letter. His final parting word to us. After telling us all these things that we got to know. He says, keep yourself from idols. And with that, we'll close our study in 1 John. And we're going to pray. Know these things. 
Know what God's Word says. You know, we get home and go through 1 John again and underline. Every time you see that word, know, there's about 26 of them. And see what we got to know for sure, be convinced of. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word tonight. And I pray, Lord, that just somehow something that might have been said this evening in a very just a humble way, Father, some, something might just click in our hearts this evening. Father, I pray if there's an idol in our life, it might not be a, a statue, it might not be a, a totem, it might not be a good luck charm, but Father, it could be anything. Father, if there's something that has been distracting us away from you, God, I pray you would reveal that to us. Father, I pray that these things that John says we need to know, we know that we have eternal life. We know that our prayers are heard and answered. We know, Lord, that we're different from the world. We know, Lord, you're going to keep us from the wicked one. We know, Lord, that we have the witness in ourselves, the Holy Spirit, to be able to share our faith with any, any who want to listen. Father, we know that through the faith in the blood of Jesus Christ, there is power that we can be set free from our bondages, from our addictions, from our habits, from our fear. Father, we know that everything we need we can find at the cross in the blood of Jesus Christ. Everything we need. Salvation, healing, righteousness, forgiveness, it's all there. And no other place. Father, we know there's nothing that we can do to make ourselves acceptable in your sight other than believe in the blood of Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you and we give you all the glory. We thank you for the gift of your son Jesus. We thank you for the Lamb of God that was slain. The perfect Passover Lamb. God, we pray you would be with us as we leave this place, but not your presence. In the name of Jesus. I want to ask, anybody have any comments or questions?